Hey, guess what, everybody? Go listen to the Break It Down show. Joining us today on the Break It Down show, we have Anthony Anarino. I got to tell you, the guy is brilliant. He does things all the time. He's talking, constantly developing new content for people. Uh, has his own website, The Sales Blog. Or is it The Sales Blog? How do we say it right? The. The. Because you have that Ohio connection. The yes. Sales Blog. That's, That's right. right. You are in Columbus. So yeah. The <laughs> Sales Blog.com. Right. And we're talking right now while the Ohio State Buckeyes play Michigan. So big day for us here. Big game day. Does huh? that even matter right yeah. now? Is Michigan worthy of even being on the field with the top 10 right now? You know, they're supposed to be our rival, but in my opinion, over the last couple of years, yeah. they've been a disappointment, and the real rival's been Michigan State. Yeah, they haven't shown up, that's for sure. How come, are you, you're not wearing, uh, is it Cardinal? What's the official color? Crimson? Scarlet. 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 I don't yeah, see, Scarlet uh, and Gray. I don't see Scarlet and Gray on you. You wear no, I told my. I told my son yesterday, cussing doesn't make you cool. Wearing all black makes you cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, that's good most of my wardrobe's black. Thanks that's for it. joining us today. Hey, I'm going to snap hey, your thanks picture. for having me. I'm happy to say that most of the people who come on our show, we go, have you listened to the podcast? And they go, man, sorry, I haven't. And, and that's okay, because then they listen to the show that we do with them, and they go, hey, man, that's pretty fucking good. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we don't mind pleasantly surprising people. Yeah. You know, sure. and, and we pick busy people anyway. So we should never be surprised when someone says, yeah, I haven't had a chance. To, man, I've been, yeah. I've been at a million things. Well, we kind of pulled you in because you've been at a million things. I did some show research. I watched a bunch of your videos and everything. And you at one point talked about ground truth. And I wondered if that reflected back to our time when we were talking. Actually, a little before that. But yeah, including that time. I mean, I, I'm actually really interested in, in learning more. And would like to find some documentation on uh, HTS. I mean, I, I I teach a stakeholder analysis, right? And it, it would be really interesting to be able to weave that in. You know, I hear a lot about stakeholders, and uh, I, I sit on a committee where we deal with pedestrian uh, issues for the Department of Transportation for my county, and they'll talk about stakeholders and. And I'm like, well, who who are the stakeholders? And they just say, you know, it's like communication. I'm like, no, we need to communicate better. We need to make sure we've got the stakeholders. Well, no shit. Who are the stakeholders? And, yeah, uh, I make them. I make clients map them. Yeah. I mean, I I want to know their name. I want to know their title. I want to know how am I supposed to create value for them? What my what, what they perceive as value from me right now? What their preferences are? What their motivating factors are? What their constraining factors are? Right. Who influences them? I make them go through a lot of work. It's funny. I did that work with Accenture. And I was teaching them how to capture value, which means not give everything away without a, a reasonable price. And the group I was working with, as soon as I put up the stakeholder map, they're like, man, don't teach us stakeholders. We do stakeholder mapping with our clients. We know stakeholders. And I said, just humor me and go through the exercise with me. I couldn't get them off of it. It took me three and a half hours with them working on one deal. And they were like, this is the best work we've ever done. And I'm like, because you found the right questions to ask. Right. That's it. You know, Pete and I came to you individually uh, from different places. Pete, where where did you? I, I met him through a friend of ours named Mark Safransky, and uh, Mark connects me to people. And he said, you and Tony need to talk. And so we did, and we did need to talk, and it was good. And I was on a LinkedIn forum for marketing executives where people seem to solicit your advice pretty frequently. And so uh, we, I think, were on a common thread and jumped off of that thread and said, hey, man, right on. Yeah. yeah. So. Isn't that weird? It, it, two, two totally different directions because Pete uh, and I share a friend, Mark, and Mark uh, is at zenpundit.com. And we met just because both of us with our deep interest in fourth generation warfare and human terrain systems and OODA loops. Me as somebody just uh, as a business person looking at what's the application of strategy and stakeholder analysis and thinking about culture, I immediately say to Mark, you know, I need somebody that's actually dealt with this in real life. And uh, he said, oh, I know exactly the guy you need to talk to. And uh, and he, he hooked me up with Pete and we spent a lot of time chatting over Skype and over email. And then we got to meet at a, a conference face to face, which was just awesome. So we've known each other for must be three years now, yeah, maybe more. Kind of, yeah. It's an overwhelming experience meeting Pete in person, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and his, well, his experiences are, are worth noting, but we'll deal with that some other time. 
Yeah, let's deal with that some other time. So before we, uh, we in the middle of our mic check, man, you dove right into some great content, and I wanted to circle back to that because I was, you know, I'm unwinding cables and stuff going, hold on, hold on, <laughs> save it for the podcast, man. So, Tony can do this all day, though. This is no big deal for him. Yeah. This is what he does. We just kicked the door in, and we were immediately talking about <laughs> something that, that we want to uh, we want to touch on, which is uh, stakeholders. And it's funny because when you think about stakeholders, and any of your clients are going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, stakeholder, everybody knows who's at stake here. And then you say, "Who? well, let's go. Who's Who are the stakeholders? I want names. I want titles. I want to know who these people are. And they go, well, we think you're yeah, – I, I can hear this all in my head. We think that your ability uh, to be objective would uh, would be better served with, you know, a little bit of anonymity. Just know that these stakeholders exist and that they know what they're doing and that they know it's at stake. But the truth is, if your name isn't on it, man, what's really at stake? Yeah. It's interesting. I, I did this uh, analysis with a group in Atlanta in October, and they said, um, here's the list of stakeholders in this deal. And there were about four or five different people on the list. And as I started to ask questions like, well, who who's going to vote? Who's going to be on the buying committee that's going to get a chance to weigh in? And as I talked more and more, I discovered none of the people that were on the list of stakeholders we were talking to were the actual people that got to vote. It was actually a government committee, and there was a board that releases the money to this group, and we didn't have a single person on the list that was on the voting committee. And so I pressed harder. I said, who do we know? And they said, well, we know this person, and they're actually on the committee. And I asked, have we met with that person? No, we haven't met with her. And, you know, so I started digging deeper and deeper, and it, it's revealed to me later on that there's a person sitting in the room that had won this particular deal in the past. And I said, what was the path that you took to get to this deal? And then he lists off four other people, two in two groups that this particular group had never even spoken to. And so as I start to push the question and say, who's really engaged in this? Who does it matter to? Who's going to have influence? Uh, and all these things matter when you're working to, to make some sort of a deal happen, whether it's in sales where I spend my time or whether it's someplace where, you know, where Pete and I were talking about him spending his time on a local government board. You got to figure out who these real people are and you've got to go spend time with them and talk to them. And it never fails that when you get that information out, you learn how do I find a path to making a deal happen? You can find that path once you start looking at who's really involved, what's motivating them, what's constraining them, who can help us. And when you start answering those questions, you can move forward pretty quickly. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I, I've spent a lot of time overseas talking to people, totally disparate groups. You know, you've got insurgents, you've got people trying not to get killed by insurgents, you've got commanders, all these different NGOs, every agencies from the U.S., and uh, they all want to know the stakeholders. That's really what they want to know, and what they refuse, like, especially commanders, because commanders are there to impose their will upon the enemy, and uh, they always want to know the spheres of influence. Who are the people I need to be talking to? Who's the most influential person in this region? I'm like, sir, it's it's you, you know? <laughs> And they, they, they always reject it at the beginning. And I'm like, you're trying to stand up and legitimize a government. If you are the most influential person in this region, you're losing. And it's an eye opening thing. They get it. They, you know, it takes them a minute, but it's so contrary to their training. They, they refuse to accept it at first. And it takes some time and you have to illustrate it. And it takes me about, probably about three or four weeks of constant daily reports to get them to go, I need to back off. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm a big uh, proponent of the work that Anthony Robbins does, and not, not his personal power stuff as much as the stuff he does with therapists and psychologists, psychiatrists, people who do strategic interventions. And I think about the work that you've done, you know, in, in difficult uh, war-torn situations, and you think that if the commander is the most significant person there, then that means that the tribal leader is not the most significant person. And who do we really need to be the most significant person to go out and get the win so that they can influence the people that they lead? It's not the commander, because if he's the winner and the tribal leader's the loser, then the whole thing is lost, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's and we fine. have the same situation in, this, in the world of sales and business, but we think that we have to have the win. And the win is really making sure the person that needs that significance, that needs that victory, gets it. That's a great point. So let's dial this back to... You do a lot of motivational speaking, a lot of keynote, 
And when you do those things, how do you get stuff like that across on such a broad level? That's a great question. It's one I, I haven't spent very much time answering, but I'll tell you one thing I've learned is that I, I think the thing that you have going for you when you walk into a room to speak to any group of people that I would speak to, they're aspirational, they want to do better, they want to work harder, they want to work smarter. So I have all these natural things going when I step onto a stage. It's really just equipping them with the the tactics if they already have the mindset, but I think of it as help them with the mindset, help them with the skill set, help them with the toolkit. So the way that I try to convey that is to make sure that I set up the mindset. And then when I get to the skill set and people have to adopt a new belief and a new behavior, I try to do it with a lot of humor. I try to make it fun and funny and interesting for people because when you give them a heavy bit of medicine, then it's better when it's surrounded with something sweet. And I'll, I'll say this another way. People know that they need to do better. But when you ask them to take those steps, the only obstacle in your way between where you are right now and where you want to be is you. And the sooner you realize that you have to change, you have to change what you believe, you have to change the actions you're taking, you have to go learn more. Yeah, that's a tough that's a tough message. But if you can make it fun and funny and interesting for people, then they'll accept that message uh, better. At least that's been my experience. Well, I'm going to give you a little plug here because I woke up this morning Thank you, by the way. I woke up this morning to the Hustler's Playbook, How to Become a Hustler. And this is a lot of the stuff that you're saying here are the things that you had in today's blog about, you know, rejecting the negativity and making room for your the idea of abundance in your life. And when you break through that barrier, because, you know, when I read when I read your stuff, Absolutely. It applies to business. It applies to performance at work. But it's a little more internal for me, and I don't know how everybody else takes it. But to me, these are life lessons that I like to apply. I mean, when I was reading the Hustler's Playbook this morning, I had my grandson asleep on my chest. You know, I'm thinking about all of these things and how my example of these things affects him and affects my kids and affects the people around me and the people in, in my house. You know, when you have that spoonful of sugar that you're, you know, that you're applying to the medicine, you try, you're trying to break down a wall. And right. it's one thing to walk into a room as a speaker and get through that process because you're, you're breaking down everybody else's wall, but it really does start with your own personal walls. Right. I mean, I can be there and receive that message and receive it with a level of, immediate effectiveness. In other words, I'm going to be motivated by the things that you say and apply them to my to my work and my work environment for the next week or so. And that's going to taper off unless I continue to sharpen my own saw. And if I change my attitudes, I feel like that's, you know, the, that's the personal thing will affect the professional thing. It's it's all personal though, isn't it? I mean, and every and people, I, I get asked this question a lot. Like, you do all these different things. You know, how do you, how do you keep track of all the different things that you're doing and all the different things that you're involved in? I'm me wherever I go. I mean, I'm always me wherever I show up. So that's the one thing. If you have control over anything, it's your own individual beliefs, your own individual actions, your own skills. You know, those are the things that you can impact. If you want to impact other people, that's the very best place to work. And we so much think, well, I want to change this other individual. You can't change anybody. All you can do is change yourself and then have a response from them that reflects that change. And that's a tough lesson to learn. But, I mean, to talk about the Hustlers Playbook, which I don't know if this is the 30th of 30th or, or it's right in that neighborhood. I've been writing these week after week every Saturday. It started out sort of like you described. You had your your grandchild on your chest. For me, it was me writing down observations about this world that we live in that I want my three kids to know. And I started thinking about, this is not the the age that our parents grew up in. You're not going to get a job at the factory making $65,000 a year. You're going to have that job for life. You're going to have a retirement and a pension. You're going to get a gold watch and they're going to have a party. That's not going to happen for them. And so part of me is looking, saying, I got to prepare these kids to live in a world that's not only nothing like the world that our parents lived in, it's nothing like the world that we live in now. They're going to have to be prepared to be very, very different people. 
And so I thought, I'm, I need to start writing Greek lessons down. And the more I wrote them, the more I thought, this isn't only for my kids. There are a lot of people that need to read this because everything starts in your mind. Everything begins in your mind. And so what you believe impacts your actions. What actions you take are, are what produces your results, but it starts with your mind. And I see so many people with a scarcity mindset. They believe that there's not enough, that they can't have what they want because somebody else has it. They have all these fears and they embrace these fears. And, you know, I watch my Facebook feed right now. It's two sets of fears. It's one set of fears about Ferguson from one group of people. And it's another set of fears about Ferguson from another group of people. But it's all fear being fed by the media who profit from that fear. I see so many people who are, are cynical and they think that uh, if I buy into this and that may, that makes me something, whatever it is in their mind, that we are those of us who are all in and drink the Kool-Aid. But that cynicism is just really their own fear and not believing that they're, they're good enough, that they're strong enough, that they've got something to contribute, that they can make a difference. And so I see all these things and I'm compelled to write about them because I believe that when you change those beliefs, your life changes uh, dramatically and irrevocably. I mean, you are different, a different person with those beliefs than you are right now. You brought up a great point, and, and uh, the cynic is going to say, well, how did you do it? And your story, Anthony, is great. Would you tell us kind of how you made that transition where you said, I'm going to write every single day for the next, the rest of my life? Tell us that, how you got to that point where you said enough is enough, there is enough out there, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go hustle, I'm going to go get mine. I didn't, I didn't understand it, but I started to watch what was going on. You know, right now we're talking to each other. I'm in Ohio. You're in California. We're using Skype. We both have professional equipment sitting in front of us, microphones, computers. And I just started watching this toolkit being used. And I bought my own name as the domain name. I bought anarino.com and I put a blog up and I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do or what I was supposed to say. I didn't know. And then I started watching some other people, and I credit really two people with really helping me to understand what was going on and what I was supposed to do. And the first was Seth Godin, and Seth has written 18 books or something, probably all of them bestsellers. And he's written a blog post every day or more than every day since maybe 2006. And then I've got a buddy, Chris Brogan, at chrisbrogan.com. And Chris, I would credit him for really laying out the playbook for social media and how you use these tools. But I watched Chris posting every day, and I watched him build community. And Chris is known as being a social media guy because his social media presence is so big. But he's not a social media guy. He's a community guy. He's a guy that builds and nurtures communities. And I started watching that happen, and I thought, I, I need to enter this game, and now I know what to do. What I did was I, I decided that the way that you create value for other people, and by doing that, develop a, an audience or a community of your own is to share everything you know. And I still remember it was almost five years ago. It'll be five years ago in a month. I sat down with my wife and I said, I'm going to start blogging every day and I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning and write. And within a year, I'll be keynoting sales conferences and I'm going to take this different path for my life. And she said, I really don't understand anything that you just said. I have no idea what you're talking about. But, you know, I love you and I support you. And literally, I just started getting up at five o'clock in the morning, stepping over the dogs to uh, get a cup of coffee, because even your dogs don't want your time at five o'clock in the morning. And and then I would just, I walk into my office and I would sit down and I would start tapping on the keys one blog post at a time. So I'm I think at, at the time we're recording this, I'm about 25 posts away from 2000 and minus 13 days when I was in Tibet. And I really didn't think I should be writing, although now I wish I would have. Uh, I've written every single day, and it's been tremendous for me. I've joined a number of communities. I have the privilege of serving a bunch of people and sharing this information, and it's resulted in uh, a ton of, of speaking and consulting work for me. Your daily musings, if we can call them that, it seems like when you say you're going to get up every morning and you're going to write something, I think a lot of us have done that exercise where some days you're just not inspired to write and you churn something out anyway. And it's just something, you know, you, you hold yourself to the standard of writing every day. And the reason that I bring this up is because I, I got into an exercise of writing every day. And some days it would just be bullshit. I would just get up and go, okay, I'm just going to write something. It's going to be bullshit. It, this was a writing exercise for myself, not for the world, to witness we're going to get back to what I just said. 
But when I was doing this writing exercise for myself and not the world to witness, some days I just didn't have it. And I would just churn out some bullshit just to be disciplined and write something so that I would be able to say, okay, today I was disciplined and I wrote, and I'll give myself credit for that. But your daily writing doesn't have any bullshit in it. I have not followed you from day one. I've probably been following you since about, it's been uh, a little over two years now. And when I, when we first crossed paths, I believe it was in a marketing VP forum on LinkedIn. And you'd said something that rang truer than other things that I had heard about a uh, fear of cold calling. And so I started to tune in. And I started to realize that, you know, you have a lay person's ability to convey a point, which means that even though you're on that forum, it was just marketing VPs and CMOs. And so we speak a little bit of a different language, but you still were able to, you know, speak that language, but convey a point in a way that made people say, man, this guy is just like us. I can relate to what he has to say. And this is a real this isn't a motivational speaker, quote unquote. This is actually something that is truly motivating. And and that's what allowed me to continue the conversation. And it wasn't like there was an epiphany over something that you said. It was something that you said just caught me. So I looked back and then you and I started a conversation and we allowed and I allowed the conversation to continue and I allowed myself to be further and further influenced by the conversation because you didn't waver. I mean, you don't get up and write bullshit some days. H how is that? Well, if you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. Well, first, thank you for saying the, the kind words. I appreciate it. But, you know, it's, it's funny. I write every day with a, a couple beliefs. And, and one is what I'm writing today is not necessarily useful for the people that happen upon the blog today, but I've got a link called archives and I've got everything I've written for the past five years there that you can go through and find. And what's interesting is it, you, you find what you need when you need it. Thanks to Google, when you search cold calling or you search discipline in sales, or you search stakeholder analysis, you're going to find the posts from me that you need when you need it. And and it's it's funny how much of it's bullshit. It's really interesting as a writer because some days I write something with such conviction and I'm absolutely convinced that that's going to be the post that people say, that was so important to me. I really appreciate it. I needed that. And those aren't the posts that get any attention at all. It's the one-off post that you write that you're like, I don't have anything in me today. I just have this one bullshit idea. It's not big enough. It's not good enough. Nobody's going to care. And that's the post that gets 5,000 views because that's the one that spoke to the most people. And that's all your inner critic, your self-doubt. My idea is not big enough. My idea is not good enough. The idea finds the people that it's intended to find when and where it needs to, you know, thanks to this toolkit. So I write every day with the faith that some people aren't going to like what I wrote today, but it's going to find the people who it's supposed to find. Okay. I get that. But you've <laughs> truly written something poignant, and I appreciate that you put it that way. But my, well, I'm just going to write bullshit day, might be a page full of bullshit, 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 comma, <laughs> bullshit, 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 <laughs> semicolon, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. I think, though, if I may interpret the point that you're making, as long as we're churning every day and as long as we're churning with the healthy attitude that, you know, we are good enough and that we do bring value to the world and that something that we say is going to have value to somebody at some point, then whatever it is you write, if it's from sincere personal knowledge and belief that it's going to benefit, then it really isn't bullshit. That's right. 
You know, I don't know. I, I just tried to pull up Wikipedia while we're talking. I don't know how many songs the Beatles wrote. I think they had something like maybe 27 number one hits out of, you know, over 600 songs or something like that. And that's a lot of songs to come up with your 27 hits from. And I, I think of it that way. It's a numbers game. If you want to write great ideas, write a lot of ideas. If you want to capture some great truths, write about all the truths that you see and and some of them are going to resonate with people. Okay, so I have a question for you that is of a personal nature. You're sitting in front of your bookshelf, and you can tell a lot about a guy by his bookshelf. And, of course, there are things back there that one would expect to see, given that you are in the business that you're in, you know, books uh, about business, etc. But there's a big book right behind you that says Paul Stanley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And so that, to me, just says, I have a a face that I put on at work, the business face. That business face is not painted like Paul Stanley. But it is, to me, I mean, you hide nothing. No, and in fact, if you watch my, my speaker reel, you'll see me in every venue that I play getting, you know, as many as 2,000 people standing up, rocking out to Death Leopard or Whitesnake, throwing the devil horns. Because I fronted a rock band from the time I was 17 to 25, and that's part of my story. And uh, I'm still a rock guy, and my wife knows that, so she bought me the Paul Stanley book, knowing that when I was a kid, um, before I wanted to be David Coverdale, which uh, was about 17, but before, up to that time, oh, I wanted to be Tony Paul Stanley. Writhing on oh, the hood of a Jaguar. Who doesn't want to exactly. Be Tony. Anyway. Exactly. I tell the story. I remember I saw uh, White Snake in 1984 open up for Quiet Riot. and I, I I tell the story about how I wanted to be David Coverdale because of what I saw. But what I mean is when I saw the women respond to David Coverdale the way that they responded to David Coverdale, I started a rock band immediately. immediately. I went home, I called my brother, and I'm like, I am starting a rock band today. I can't wait another day. Yeah, there's a mission. <laughs> you know, you were officially the second guest to be a huge Paul Stanley fan. Another guy who's a drummer, Jason McEnroth, he drums at the uh, Blue Man Group. And he loves Paul Stanley. He loves Kiss, but he he's like it's Paul. Especially Paul Stanley. Yeah, it's yeah. Paul's band. It's Paul is the genius behind that band. So that's he just, is. It, it's funny how John and I keep finding these uh, uh, grains of similarity, common threads. Yeah, yeah. Those common threads include Paul Stanley for sure. Right. I'd say they also include the uh, appeal of of wanting the results of David Coverdale. Well, yeah, <laughs> I want that. <laughs> and the years perhaps have not been kind to certain parts of that equation, but. Uh, at the time, yeah, he's the king of the world, and why wouldn't you say, hey, man, he's doing something that I think I would really enjoy? And I did. Another thing, too, about about the threads that we find is, like, our last show, we sat down with our band band director, our band leader, uh, Corey Jacobs, and he said, anybody can play the piano as good as me. They can get up and they can practice. The Not true. No, no. And However. It, right, yeah. I mean, he plays the piano like a madman, and he does practice all the time. It's his passion. It's his gift. And the same thing is true with you. You sort of make light about, oh, you know, I get up at five in the morning. No one else wants my time. A minute before five in the morning, it's four something in the morning. Five in the morning is early. And to get up every single day and grab that rock, pick it up, carry it 200 meters, put it down. That's hard. But it's not just the humility of, well, it's just what I do, you know, and this is just what happened. But it, that is the other the other common thread is the absolute discipline and dedication to craft that makes you say today, also today, not tomorrow, but today, and then tomorrow, also today. Right. And I, get up I, and just grind at it. I don't know Corey, but I would tell you my guess, having not met him, I I don't have to write i can't not write i i write because i can't not write every day and my guess is Corey doesn't have a day where it's a great day for him if his fingers aren't on the keys right you know for him that's a bad day that i couldn't do that and that's that's the way i feel about about writing and sharing and trying to help people produce better results no you're if right. i'm not doing it's that impossible. i'm not happy you're right yeah. right but let me say this. There are still people who have not found the spigot. And I think what it is, is you guys have found the spigot to where you can't bottle that up now. You've found the means and the purpose where that, that water's going to run. And if you try and dam it up, 
man, it's going to overflow, it's going to back up, and it's going to burst at some point. Yeah, bad things are going to come from that. Bad things are going to come from it. So I think one of the things that, that you talk about in the Hustler's Playbook is, and, and I don't want to paraphrase, but, you know, figuratively speaking, finding that spigot. And that spigot has to do with your personal attitudes about about things, about your openness to success, about your ability to say, yes, what I have is good enough. What I do is good enough. And it demands the uh, the attention of others who could benefit from it. It does. And, you know, I, I see so many people, uh, and I wrote this in one of the lines today, but I've written it a number of times, different places. I think if you click on the link in today's Hustlers Playbook, uh, there's a permission slip I wrote for people uh, to that they can sign themselves and have themselves sign off on because the only one you're waiting for permission from is you i mean you have to just start taking the actions whatever it is whatever your gift is it's your job to just go out and share that and like what we're doing right now you know you've decided that you you're going to have a radio broadcasting you know channel and no one came along and gave you permission to do this because we don't live in that age you're not um i don't know either one of you well enough to know this but i'm going to go out on a limb and say you've not been to broadcasting school you don't have a certificate no one came along and tapped you on the shoulder and said, now, son, now you may go forward and broadcast. You decided you had a gift to share and you pick up the microphone and you start saying, look, we're going to do this because this is our way to help people. It's how we can create value. And by creating that value, we can make something, you know, beautiful and good and right and true and wonderful in our world. And that's why we do it. But that's the part that I think most people have something they want to do, but they don't think that they're allowed to do or they think that they have to. I remember when I decided to start coaching, somebody said, now, do you have a certificate in coaching? And I said, no, I don't have a certificate. And they said, well, then how are you going to do this? I said, I'm going to start coaching people. I don't need the certificate. I only need the ability to create value. And I already have that. But they're still thinking in their mind that I, I need to get somebody's blessing and someone's permission to do what I do. And you don't have to wait anymore. That is spectacular. And I don't want to... Uh twist what you have to say but if i may reinterpret for some of our listeners um, that doesn't mean go out and coach people it means go out and do whatever you were gonna do whatever it is i mean if it's if it's uh coaching others performance or helping sales organizations improve their numbers or whatever it is there is something go do it well, that that's the keyword right there doing you know and, and a hustler does things yeah that's how you flex your hustle muscle yeah, like our, our favorite story about Paul Williams. Is, you know, the little guy from Smoking the Bandit, Little Enos? He yeah. went to Hollywood to go become an actor. And what he became. No, he went to Hollywood to become a movie star. A movie star. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And what he became was a songwriting Hall of Fame member. He had no idea that he had the ability to write songs. He, he didn't play a musical instrument. He walked into a thrift store one day. He saw a guitar in the thrift store. He bought it for a few bucks. He took it home. He banged on it a little bit, came up with a little ditty that he thought was catchy and amused himself, and then just started writing and wrote all kinds of things. I mean, not necessarily the uh, – I don't think of him as John Lennon. Let, let's put it that way. But he did write the theme song to the, the TV show Love Boat. He did. He wrote the Love Boat theme song. I believe he also wrote Love American Style. He uh, And he was just sort of personified the swinging 70s on TV. He's He actually appeared on the Love Boat several times. But he wrote the Rainbow Connection. And the, he just became this prolific songwriter because he didn't have anything else to do. And even though he went to Hollywood to be a movie star, it took him a while to realize that, hey, you know what? I, I didn't, I don't look like Paul, Paul Newman. I don't look like Brad Pitt. I don't, the dude does not look like any of those people. You know, it, he had songs inside him though. And you don't get that gift if you keep the songs inside. And he also, so and I don't, he shared. Know, right, exactly. He let them out and he put them in front of people. And I'm sure that during that process, some of those things were not as great as others, but he let them out. Yeah, I'm not sure the theme from the Love Boat is going to be on uh, radio anytime soon, but you know, for its time, that and because of my age and and well, all of us here are advanced years. You know, we could sing the song right now. It had a hook. Would you like it was to? on no, TV let's, let's every like day. Not to. Would you like? To? <laughs> <laughs> oh. But that's the thing, and that became what made him his personal fortune, 
and then gave him a level of renown that allowed him to kind of play out the movie star dream that he had because he was a compelling figure. But you're right. Nobody gave him nobody gave him permission. He gave himself That's permission. Right. I just pulled that permission slip up and listeners, you again can go to the dot com and uh, check out the hustlers playbook. The uh, permission slip is a link on the November, November 29th hustlers playbook. Uh, blog entry. So check it out. Take a look at it. You have to uh, first acknowledge guardianship of yourself and then go on to give yourself permission to do your stuff. So, you know, it seems it seems silly that we have to be goaded humorously into doing these things, but it is kind of a channel to where we can sort of laugh at it and go, yeah, I'm the guardian of myself. Yes, I give myself permission. And we're going to chuckle about those things, but ultimately we got to break that barrier down. And like you said, you found a way to do it through humoring the crowd when you walk into a room. Sure. And this is sort of the one-on-one way to do it online. I could see Paul Williams in in my mind, though. I could see him, short guy, long, uh, blonde hair with the glasses. The glasses, yeah, very... Very memorable. And he was always uh, wearing like a, gl- a like a sequined jumpsuit or something just ridiculous. <laughs> where you go, man, where? Uh, hey, little dude. But then pretty soon it was like, hell, oh, I'm fine. hanging out with this little dude. <laughs> he is he's draped in blondes. Yeah. He's draped in supermodels. David, Why is he hanging around with Cheryl T? He's getting David Coverdale ass. He's getting Scott Bale ass. Yeah, you know. All right, so let's talk about the mixing of personal and professional because you clearly have a way of doing it that you pull off. And I think I struggle with pulling it off because I do have the professional face. This is the thing that I wanted to get back to that I said earlier. I do have a business persona that then is all business, but I am also inappropriately vulgar. And that's where I find my humor. And I let little bits of it out. The fact of the matter is I don't feel comfortable letting it all out. And I know that that's not something you can always do all of the time, but there's got to be a balance, and I don't know that I've found it, because sometimes I put on my appropriate voice and my sit-up-straight and tighten-my-tie voice, and then other times, screw the tie, and I let it out, and it's more fun. So how do you find yourself personally striking that balance, and, and are there a lot of executives out there that you run into who have the upright personality, and then you get them... Uh, bellied up to the bar with a drink in their hand and they go, Jesus, you motherfucker, that was a great speech. That, that, I mean, that happens more often than you know, and I'll tell you why. And it's not just about being inappropriate, it's about being authentic and being real and, and being in that moment. And what happens is when you can get very real and very authentic, you give other people permission to do the same thing. And they really want to let their hair down too. But they've got their business base on. I'm all business, too, and they can't let down until you let down. Somebody has to go first. Somebody has to say it's okay. I'll just share a, a little story with you. I, I tell uh, my story, my my brain surgery, and you know how I, I came to understand some of the truths that I came to understand at a young age. And one story I tell, actually the story, that whole story of the seizure to the brain surgery, I have I had a graphic artist who... It, who animated my slides so it looks like a graphic novel as I tell the story. But at one point of the story, I have a paramedic come over to me, and he corners me in my house, and he says, listen, you little asshole, what time do you get home from work? And I got home at 5.30, but it was 6.15. So the point he was making is that for 45 minutes, I, I didn't know where I was, and he was trying to convince me that I'd have the seizure. So I have got this slide, and the slide says, listen, asshole, what time do you get home from work? And I give the slide deck to the company that I'm speaking to, and it goes through their marketing department, and they're like, oh, we can't say that. Uh, we can't say that. You got to take that off the slide. And I said, well, it's, it's not meant in any kind of harmful way. It's actually the quote that was said to me, you know, in this particular story. And we went round and round about this slide until the, finally I said, okay, fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redact it. I'll put a big black block over it. And then, of course, when I'm on stage, I tell the story and I say, listen, you little asshole, what time did you get home from work? And the audience busts out laughing and no one's offended by it at all. And from that point forward, there's some truth and some humanity and some authenticity to what I'm doing. The word doesn't offend anybody because it's real and it it was actually what happened. It was somebody trying to get my attention, which, which he did successfully. But I think 
that that's just to go to, to I guess make this point. You you have to be willing to share your authentic self at some level because other people can't see who you really are and they can't relate to you. What you're saying doesn't resonate with them unless you're willing to be personal and share that side of yourself. Man, that's profound right there. And uh, it goes to a lot of what I've seen in my time overseas. Uh, every manual, every exercise you talk about with the military and State Department people, you're going to go interact with locals. They talk about you have to establish rapport. And it's kind of like, let's communicate better and let's identify the stakeholders. How the fuck do you establish rapport? How do you know when you have it? And even better, how do you get to trust? And what are those steps? What are those mile markers? You're talking about one of those mile markers right there. Be yourself. You know, yeah, be formal, be be appropriate, but let your guard down a little bit so the person can kind of know who you are and uh, begin to trust you. And and what I would call on my end of the, the professional side of the fence post with them, identify different things you have that are in common and then build a fence together from there. But you both have a fence up to that point. Identify those fence posts. You know, in your world, what, what's challenging some of it is what we have in the business world, too. The best way for you to gain rapport with somebody who you have an adversarial relationship with. And I mean, in, in the situations that you were in, Pete, everybody's an adversary. And your adversaries, the people next door to them are their adversaries. So the whole place is a giant mess of adversarial relationships. And they all, all might fear you. And they all might kill you and everyone around them, right? So the hard part, as if, if you want to gain rapport, is to be vulnerable and to share your fears and to express truth when you, you put yourself at risk by being vulnerable. And I'm not saying being vulnerable in a physical way because that would be bad for you in that situation, but being vulnerable in an emotional way and trying to allow that human connection to happen with with other human beings in a situation that's, you know, one hostile and volatile. And I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm, I'm saying this looking at you going, I wasn't there in the hostile situations I've been at. There might have been millions of dollars at stake, but there weren't dozens or hundreds of lives at stake. Well, I'm going to add to that because as you say these words, of course, I'm thinking of them as words of advice and, and you know, it, viewing it in the first person as you intend it. But then I view it in the third person and I think when I see that vulnerability in an adversary and when they step forward with it, you know, that is the olive branch. That's what makes you go, hey, man, maybe I had y'all wrong. Somebody has to go first. Right. You know, and, and, and it's the the courage is, is going first. I mean, that's what it really is, to, to be vulnerable and to allow some of that out. Th that's what really takes courage. It's not withholding that. Thanks for listening this week. This conversation was the first of hopefully a great many, a long series of conversations between us and Anthony Anarino. We are big fans of his. He's a friend, and we really love his work. He really affects us positively. So we hope he does the same for you. If you want more of him, go to thesalesblog.com. You can read his daily writings and subscribe to his weekly newsletter. It is terrific, so you should do it, thesalesblog.com. Also, you should give us five-star reviews. We really appreciate those on iTunes and Stitcher and wherever you get podcasts. So please do that or go to our website, breakitdownshow.com. Follow us on Twitter, at breakitdownshow. Check us out on Facebook, breakitdownshow. And stay in touch. Give us your feedback. Tell us what you like about the show. Tell us what you'd like to hear, what you'd like more of. We really take those things seriously, and we appreciate them. Got some great feedback from Timmy Fitz and from Jason Quintero, um, from Sean Ryan, from our very first podcast guest, James Early. And we appreciate that feedback. So get on the website, send it to us, and... Uh, and keep us going. So for Pete, this is John. This is the Break It Down Show. See you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>